You, you mentioned the word cure, and that's another thing you bring up in the book, is the huge difference between the word cure and the word heal. Yeah. And modern medicine is good at curing you of symptoms, yeah. but doesn't necessarily heal you. So if, you, if, you, if you're a depression, they'll say, well, we can cure you of your symptoms. Here, take this pill. But you won't be healed, and that's why you have to take the pill for the rest of your life. Yeah, Ta that's right. How does one move from being simply cured every morning that you take your pill yeah. to being healed and not having to take the pill? Yeah, so again, language is very important here. So trauma, the essence of trauma is actually a disconnection from yourself. That is, you probably understand from what you disconnect from your body and for your feelings because you had to in order to survive. Now, healing comes from a word for wholeness. It comes from an Anglo-Saxon word for wholeness. That's the origin of it. In Hungarian, actually, um, literally, health means to be whole. It's, it's, it's that simple. Same in English, although the, the origin is not as clear, but, but the origin of the word does come from the word for wholeness. So, in other words, healing then is the restoration of those connections to yourself that you lost as a result of trauma. So healing becomes becoming whole again. Some people, and that makes life worth living to the point where, strange as it sounds, and certainly nothing I recommend, but when I was working in palliative care, um, looking after people who were terminally ill, it would not be unusual for somebody to say to me, Doc, I don't know how to explain this to you, but this disease is the best thing. This disease that's going to take my life is the best thing that ever happened to me. No, again, I'm not recommending it. All I'm saying is that some people valued the sense of becoming whole again so much that it mattered more to them than their physical survival. Um, which is not to say that they wouldn't have accepted a cure had they one been available. I'm just saying that they were valuing the wholeness that they found by confronting their death, for example. Um, a lot of people can find wholeness and significant remission of their illness by reconnecting with themselves, which is what healing means. So how to do that? Well, there's all kinds of pathways, and the longest part of the book is about healing, but it, it is about reversing that disconnection that trauma imposed on us. And towards the end of the book, you, you, you raise this, the, the word meaning, that, that the, the sort of the typical view of, of a disease, like something that comes from outside, it is essentially meaningless. Yeah. But once you begin to think, to look at your life and reconnect with it, there is a sense in which, and I think you quote several of, your, of the people you've treated, they said, once I realized my illness, it, it made sense. Yeah. And how does, tell us a bit more about what that, that sense of a meaning, uh, how that relates to wholeness and the finding... Sense of a, meaning or sense of me? Meaning. Meaning, yeah. Because it's connected, isn't it? That, that, that reconnection with you brings meaning. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that... It's a really great question, um, but it's more easily answered experientially than, than intellectually. So... Um, if, if, if you just ask yourself here, when there was purpose and meaning, genuine meaning that expressed who I actually was in my life, how did I feel? As compared to when I was doing things that were basically meaningless and didn't come from my authentic self. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, about one third of the audience. That's pretty good. The rest of you can find out. <laughs> <laughs> but. But I certainly know that when I'm doing work, when I engage in activities that express who I genuinely am, and, 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 and I find a sense of meaning in it, which is to say that what, I make, what I'm doing makes a difference in the world, or just how I'm showing up makes a difference in the world. Fundamentally, we're connected creatures. Our brains are connected to each other. Our physiology is connected to each other. So when we engage in activities that serve that connection in one way or the other, we find meaning. 
that could be through individual activity, like creativity, like art, and so on. But when you create art, you're not just thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. It's something larger process that's coming through you. You're kind of channeling the universe in some way. You're allowing yourself to open. Because I'm not an artist, but if I was, but, I, but I'm married to one. And, and, and when the artist is creating, there's something flowing through them. I, I experience that sometimes when I'm writing. Meaning is that presence of that something else other than just the egoic little self. That's why I put it. Mm. And we provide that, or we can provide that in our relationships with other people. Going back to parenting, there's yeah. a difference between being the, the parent who comes home and says, well, I brought the bacon home, honey, here's the, here's the money for pay the rent. Yeah. But that, or, or to buy your child a Game Boy or something. But it's a different thing to engage in a meaningful way, to yeah. provide meaning for them by actually physically engaging with them. Yeah, so to, exactly. So to go back to what I said about meaning is beyond my little particular concerns. I can relate to my child two ways. I can relate to my child as kind of a projection or extension of myself and I want them to be a certain way. Uh, maybe I think that's best for them, but nevertheless, I define what is best for them in terms of my own um, expectations. Or I can relate to my child as a separate human being who needs to find their own meaning, and I need to get very curious about what's happening for them. It's a totally different relationship. And I, it's not a question of whether I love the child or not. Both, both of these parents, these, both, both of these hypothetical parents can love their child equally well in terms of their goodwill or warm feelings towards them. But one of them is going to develop a meaningful relationship. The other will not. Because it's not about me, it's about the connection. And going back to the person who might feel themselves, yeah. that they might want to change something about their lives. Maybe they've got an, an immune disease, maybe they're diabetic or something. Yeah. That, the work that goes into it, is it easy? Is it, do you just start on it and day one you go, whew, I feel so much better already? Or is well, it hard? It's, <clears throat> it, it's not easy for two reasons. One is because you're stumbling around in the dark. You're, you're stumbling around in the dark of your own conscious that was shaped by early experiences. And also because it may not fit in with the life that you've created. Like if you've been in a relationship where you don't say no and you're always taken on the needs of the partner, that relationship may be in trouble if you all of a sudden start asserting yourself. So you have to face this choice again that as a child, you can only decide one way, but as an adult, you have more latitude. If I had to choose between authenticity and attachment, I mean, my own marriage, we were very clear. We married 53 years now, but it's very clear between us that had my wife had been less concerned about attachment and more connected to herself, at some point, she would have left me for her own sake and for the sake of the kids, actually. Now, we've done a lot of work and so on. I'm just saying that had she been authentic then, she would have had to decide to let the relationship go at a certain point. So it's not easy to do that because that brings up all kinds of insecurities and so on. Um, but it's not as difficult as it sounds either because, you know, just a little exercise that I teach people, it's a chapter on it in the book, but just ask yourself, um, where this week did I have trouble saying no? What I mean by that is, there's a no that wanted to be said, but you didn't say it. Very simple. Somebody asks you up to go for coffee, and you don't feel like it because you're tired. I, had, I went to this last night. I was going to have dinner with a really good friend last night. And, but I was tired. I was really tired. I just came in from Budapest. I was, you know, um, but it took a bit of an effort for me to say, look, you know, no, no dinner tonight. I need to go home and rest, you know? This is me teaching all this stuff, you know? I, I mean, I did it. I did it. I went home instead to the hotel. I had a hot bath and went to bed instead. But this tension comes up of disappointing somebody else, you know? 
And uh, no, the other person totally understood and supported my decision. So they, the problem wasn't theirs. It was simply my own mm, fear of d d disappointing somebody, even after all these years. But you can ask yourself, it's very simple. Somebody asks you out for coffee, you don't feel like it for whatever reason. You're tired, you're, you know, you're, you're upset, or you're, you, just don't, you don't feel like it, but you don't say no. More seriously, on the job, somebody, somebody asks you to take on yet another project, and you don't want to seem like you're not a team member, so you don't say no. Or in a relationship, certain demands are put on you, and you don't feel like meeting those demands, but you don't say no. Well, that will have significant impact on you. But just ask yourself once a day or once a week, where this week did I not say no? Because that no that you don't say is a marker of your authenticity. Because your authentic self wants to say no. If you don't say it, don't criticize yourself for it, but get curious about it. Where did I not say no? And secondly, um, what was the impact of my not saying no? If you don't feel like going out for coffee, and you do, what's going to be the impact on you? Or if you take on more work, what's going to be the impact on you? Thirdly, what belief did I have that kept me from saying no? So there are more, uh, you know, you know, if I say no, I'm a bad person. If I say no, I'm selfish. If I say no, they won't like me. Those are the stories that we tell ourselves. The exercise has more parts to it, but it's very simple. You just work with the word no and see how that shows up or doesn't show up in your life. That exercise alone, I've had people tell me that that exercise alone changed their lives. So yes, it's difficult, but at the same time, it's also simpler than we, than we imagine. Um, the last question before we open it to the audience. If people did what you're suggesting and, yeah. and tried to reconnect with their more authentic self, yeah. Is that a way for us to collectively heal our toxic culture? Is that enough? Is that going to work? No. Oh dear. I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was. But the people, uh, this is, I'm expressing my political perspective here now, but I think it's reasonable. The people that make the policies are the least likely to do this kind of work. Uh, politicians are notoriously lacking in self-reflection. Like, and I've studied them. Like, um, and Margaret Thatcher was completely opaque to herself. She didn't know herself at all. A lot of these people don't. That's what drives them. A lot of stuff drives them to want power, to want control. Um, and those dynamics are often unconscious. They're often rooted in trauma, but they lack self-reflection. Very few politicians are self-reflective. And. Um, so, we, we, not to mention, you know, the toxicity of this culture doesn't just reside in people being inauthentic, it also resides in, to speak of genuine, you know, say climate change. I mean, does anybody still doubt that it exists? But for decades, we've had people lying about it, hiring false scientists to put out phony papers denying climate change, even as the Earth was being continually damaged and the atmosphere was being continually damaged. Those people have a certain agenda, which is ego-driven and power-driven and profit-driven. So no personal transformation is going to succeed unless there's some sense of activism about challenging the structures in this society that keep all the inauthenticity going. And how much more inauthentic can you get than to destroy the earth? for the sake of dividends. I mean, think about it. It's meaningless, actually. But, but people are caught in a certain ideology, a certain way of looking at life, a certain way of understanding themselves, of evaluating themselves. And that keeps the system going. So I think there has to be more than just personal transformation. I think we need to in introduce a lot more awareness um, into the political culture, into the social culture, into medicine, into the law, into education. So I don't think it's just an individual concern. So you have a great deal of work to do. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Um, and are there people out there who would like to start their contribution to the work by asking a question? 
Um, we do have a microphone. Um, there's a lady down here. I'll just say that as we wait for questions is that um, the last intention I'd have is to sort of come across with a doom and gloom message. Um, I actually believe in the possibility of transformation on a personal and social level. I think people have it in us. I think hum humanity has it in us. So I, I don't think this is a losing proposition. It's daunting, but it's hardly impossible. And could I just ask, when you ask questions, try and keep it brief because there are so many questions 